Hey, you all, Carpet Bagger here, coming to you live from the north. More specifically, we are in Silver Springs, Maryland. And even more specific than that, we are in front of the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Now that name, that name may sound a little bland, may sound a little plain, but uh, there is there is some some absolute medical wonders inside of here. This museum has an interesting history. Actually, uh, was founded during the Civil War when uh, army science, not army doctors, were. Uh, studying the effects of, of injuries on soldiers there was they collected a lot of severed limbs and and, and other pieces of blown off pieces of soldiers to start their collection kind of they learned as they went about about treating treating injuries treating battlefield wounds and amputations and uh, the, the the museum grew from there collecting collecting different medical specimens. It was actually part of the Walter Reed Medical Center until it closed in 2011, in which it moved to this uh, this location. And I, I went to, I did go to the original Walter Reed version on um, the very first time I came to Washington DC, years, years before this uh, this channel started. But uh, I, I love this place. It is some of this, the amazing, a little creepy sometimes, you know, it's science, but also it's, 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 human body it's uh it's a very fascinating and you know maybe slightly ghoulish things inside so please follow me As we enter here, we are greeted by this skeleton. It says the Army Surgeon General purchased the skeleton in 1867 in France, where it was made to be a uh, anatomical model. It's separated there so you can see all the individual bones. Yeah, this collection is so amazing. Just so many strange and fascinating uh, medical artifacts here. Start out, so that big piece right there is just a, a slice of a torso. And you can see down there, a, a spinal cord pierced by an arrowhead. There's a Vietnam era boot pierced by a spike. And uh, yeah, I can just imagine the, the foot that was in that shoe probably did not uh, fare very well against that spike. And this is oddly beautiful here. This is a uh, lace work made in 1917 by a mentally ill uh, psychiatric patient. Said that uh, she imagined different people and animals, people that were not there, animals that were not there, and then would uh, put them in to her lace work there. You can see all the interesting figures intertwined in uh, in the lace there. But yeah, some of the stuff you, you see, you read the description and you can hardly believe uh, exactly what it is you're looking at. This right here is uh, the vertebrae of President James A. Garfield. They, uh, when he was assassinated, they removed parts of his spinal cord to show, you showed where the, see the little red piece there shows where the bullet entered his uh, spinal cord. But yeah, that, uh, that, that spine, that piece of spine belonged to President James A. Garfield, just sitting here in this case, a big chunk of presidential spine. And in this box next to uh, James Garfield's spine, these are uh, Ulysses S. Grant's tumors. There is uh, slides of his actual tumors. He died from cancer. And uh, they have some of his cancer in there a box full of presidential cancer so we have a presidential spine and a box of presidential cancer yeah here at the uh the national museum of health and medicine you definitely get to check out some chunks of presidents while you're here i don't know that i've ever seen this many uh presidential chunks in uh, one museum and this is abel abel is a uh, rhesus monkey 
that uh, went to space in 1959. One of the first animals to ever go to space. And what's really interesting about Abel, you can come here to the Museum of Health and Medicine and see Abel's skeleton. But uh, if you want, if you want more Abel, if you can't get enough of Abel, you can uh, head over to the Air and Space Museum and see uh, Abel's taxidermied skin. And I, don't, I think another one of these monkeys that was on the flight with Abel is actually buried at uh, the, the Rocket Center in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. And this skull here is from the 19th uh, century. It uh, was covered in gold for some reason. I don't know, it's a human skull uh, plated in gold. And if this here looks a little horrifying, it uh, it kind of is. This is a uh, a surgical chainsaw with a hand crank. So this would be used to saw through skin and bone, and would, you know, so that I guess the, the the doctor, the surgeon, would hold it and just crank crank it like it was an egg beater, and uh, it would turn the chain and it would cut through uh, your bones. This is a diorama of people being vaccinated for typhoid back in 1909. It's like a medical breakthrough of being able to vaccinate against these terrible diseases. Although I do like the diorama, how everyone's holding their shoulder. I don't know, maybe the typhoid vaccine uh, left them a little sore. There's part of like a modern prosthetic leg sleeve here to show that you know people can decorate them uh, however they like there's a patriotic leg sleeve remember the guy uh, the guy from Tiger King who had the uh, the uh, evil clown uh, uh, leg sleeves for his prosthetics take a peek here inside the museum's laboratory and this is where they prepare wet specimens other uh, items of course you know the museum works with a lot of human tissue, so it's very important to be able to uh, preserve it appropriately. And then here down in the window is something amazing and horrifying. This is a hairball that was taken out of a girl's stomach. She had a habit of chewing on her hair. And I remember back in school, there was, uh, there was a girl who always chewed on her hair and the teacher told her that they would they would it would lump up in her stomach and form this big hairball. Of course, everyone thought the teacher was just trying to scare her, but it this is apparently legitimate. You can see there's so much hair; it's literally the shape of uh, of the stomach, almost the entire stomach filled with hair. Just to offer a little bit of perspective, that's the hairball. That's my head. That is a big hairball. I mean, it's, it's amazing that someone could survive with, with that much hair in their belly. Some models of United States hospital ships. These are big, big floating hospitals, basically. It says that this, uh, this one here, the J.K. Barnes, was used during the very end of the Civil War to transport uh, wounded soldiers. And then here is the USS Solace here. This was used from uh, 1898 through 1921. Exhibit on chemical warfare here. There is a gas mask used in uh, World War I. And then there is a human trachea showing the effects of mustard gas inhalation. Yeah, that definitely uh, definitely doesn't look like a healthy trachea. I remember reading about this in Ripley's Believe It or Not. This is the tibia and fibula of uh, one General Daniel E. Sickles. This is uh, Daniel Sickles right there. He was struck in the leg by a cannonball, which sounds sounds awful. You know, I have uh, I have bumped my shin against uh, many footstools as I get up trying to walk around the house at night, and that's painful. I can only imagine having a cannonball shot into your shin. So you can see his, uh, his shin shattered there. 
But what uh, what I what part of the story I think is really fascinating is that uh, Daniel Sickles would actually come to this museum regularly just uh, to visit to visit his lower leg here. As I mentioned, this museum was founded on the idea of studying Civil War injuries, so a huge amount of their collection is dedicated to these Civil War uh, injuries, these, these bones and pieces of human bodies that have been damaged by war. You can see, yeah, you can see that bone there still has a bullet in it lodged there in, uh, in, the, be in the leg there. You can see other other bullets there, bullet peeking out, right there. Oh yeah, yeah those have the. You can see the bullets peeking out of those holes. Yeah, it's crazy. All these, all these bones full of, full of bullets, just riddled with bullets. There's a. Oh yeah, there's a vertebrae down there, with uh, with a bullet in it. Oh, yeah, all these bones. I'd hate to have a bullet lodged in my spine or pelvis. The skulls here, you can see the cranium cracked from a gunshot. There's a bullet sticking out of the top of a skull. There's a gunshot wound to the face, which looks absolutely horrible. There's a tibia with a shrapnel wound. It's that giant piece of metal lodged in the bone there. See these skulls here, all of them have holes in them where the bullets entered uh, entered their craniums. Really sad when you think about it. Each one of these was an actual person who lived, had a life, and uh, had a, 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 a quick and painful uh, ending to that life. There's a lung with a gunshot wound in it. You can see the hole right there in the middle of the lung. This is Captain Henry Wurz, who was a Confederate captain during the Civil War who was accused of war crimes. You can see he's actually on the gallows there, so things did not work out for him. He was accused of uh, brutality to the uh, Union soldiers that were in his POW camp and uh, convicted of, uh, of these brutal acts. But apparently he, he claimed that he could not have committed any brutality because he could not use his right arm. So what they did was they fully examined his right arm after uh, after he was executed, and they determined that it was fine. Nothing wrong with it. So here it is on display in a museum as proof that, uh, that he had no issues, that he was lying, and that he really was a, uh, a brutal man and, and tortured uh, POWs. Also, there's his, uh, there's his, uh, there's two, two of his vertebrae. Yeah, an unbelievable amount of just pieces of human beings that were uh, injured, killed during uh, during the Civil War. Wow, it's just amazing to think, you know, these were real people that sustained these injuries. Oh my gosh, look at that. That skull there has a bullet lodged right between its eyes. Here's the skull of a African-American uh, soldier who died from a uh, iron canister ball to his temple. Yikes! Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's that, that's pretty devastating. All these bullets here were actually removed from human bodies. We saw the ones lodged in the bones. These were all successfully removed from uh, human bodies, and uh, these right here actually says which uh, which soldier. They have the names of the soldiers. That uh, that were removed, that these bolts were removed from. Oh, and it does look like, even though they were removed from the bodies, I guess a lot of these um, did die as a result. This is a bullet that killed Lieutenant Henry Waite, the bullet that killed Private James Bainham. One, uh, but one interesting <laughs> bullet here, as they as they point out right here, is this bullet from T. B. Beat, who was a it was a private in uh, the Pennsylvania Infantry. Apparently he got shot with a bullet and uh, they were unable to, to remove it, unable to find it. However, two weeks later, he actually pooped out the bullet. So that bullet went to his body and then was successfully pooped out his butt. This notebook here was kept by Sergeant Don Statz 
and it actually saved his life, that it deflected a, a bullet. Okay, so now you've been shot, your bones are splintered, you have a bullet in you, and here is the medical equipment that would be used to, uh, to help you out there. You've got the big saw, the big knife, the big old, uh, big old sharp pinchers. You can see the different tools here used for uh, field surgery. That's just a spoon. Like, this is all surgical implements. That, it's just a spoon. It's the amputation saws there. And uh, there is a glass hospital urinal. That's what the soldiers would pee in while they were in the hospital. This is a portable autopsy kit in case you just need to do an autopsy in, uh, in an emergency. These are all different medical kits. There. There's a, a clamp for arterial compression. But here is probably the crown jewel of this museum. We've seen all the, uh, the, the, the bone pieces, the bullets used to kill people in the Civil War. Well, here we have the bones and bullet of Abraham Lincoln. Yes, they actually have the skull fragments. Abraham Lincoln's skull fragments. Look right there. Those pieces were taken during his autopsy. Those are the, uh, f are the six little chunks. Six little chunks that were taken from the president who was assassinated. There's an additional skull chunk found in uh, the doctor's autopsy kit after the fact. And here are the sleeve cuffs of Dr. Edward Curtis while he was working on Abraham Lincoln. Those blood stains, that's Abraham Lincoln blood. And there we have it. In the National Museum of Health and Medicine, we have the bullet formerly located in the brain of Abraham Lincoln. That is the bullet that struck down Abraham Lincoln. And uh, yeah, just look at that, that little piece of metal. Think about how, uh, how much of history that uh, little piece of metal altered and how different things may have ended up if, uh, if not for that little piece of metal. This is the probe that was inserted into uh, Lincoln's brain trying to find the bullet. Uh, also, uh, these are some hairs taken off of Lincoln. These were removed from his head wound. And we have some models of early ambulances. There's a horse-drawn ambulance there. And then this hospital train car. You can just see they have all the uh, sick and uh, wounded soldiers there packed into the train. Over here we have some more of these strange and horrifying specimens such as this elephantitis leg in, uh, in the jar there had to be amputated and uh, it sits bloated in this jar at the museum. And here we have a man that, that personally I, I feel had one of the, the hardest lives of any human being ever born, Peter Cluckley. And uh, here we have his whole skeleton. Uh, Peter Cluckley pretty much the, the, had the worst case of arthritis ever documented. It even says here that they really don't know the full diagnosis because it doesn't match with anything that anyone else uh, had. But uh, his joints became so arthritic that they got to the point where he simply could not move. He had to sit helpless in this chair all day because uh, he simply could not move. He was like a, literally a prisoner in his own body, completely awake, completely conscious, but just unable to move. All he could do was sit in, uh, in this chair. Um, he also became addicted to, to opioids, which, you know what, you, 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 we can't even blame him for that. We, you know, this seems like that, you know, if you're living a life like this, you would, you would definitely just need, need some form of relief. See, his front teeth are moving. Those were actually removed so that he could be, uh, that he could be fed because he couldn't open his mouth. 
to you know he couldn't open his, his his skull at all so they had to take out his teeth so that they could feed him and that is wow that is the the very sad story of uh of peter cluckley i mean now he sits still frozen in place here at the national museum of health and medicine yeah a lot of strange items here with very interesting diseases there is a uh, a chicken leg and a chicken tumor you can see the tumor split open apparently this this chicken leg actually won someone a nobel prize in tumor inducing viruses these feet here these preserved feet have smallpox and this is a mega colon just a, a giant enlarged colon your colon's not supposed to be that big believe it or not all these preserved diseased organs here right here is a larynx where someone choked to death on a chunk of steak there's another stomach hairball so they have two of these complete completely full stomachs full of hair here in this museum up there that's a smoker's lung you can see it's all full of tar and garbage and uh, yeah bad stuff if you know if, if you smoke you may want to consider uh, Maybe I'll consider thinking about trying some alternatives because I, I would hate for that to happen to uh, any of you. Now we've seen a lot of bones injured in combat with bull bullets and cannonballs, but here's a special section of bones that were shot and then got infected. And you can see, I didn't realize like how much the infection could actually affect the actual bone. You can see it just like completely changes the consistency of the bone. They were, they were unfortunate enough to get shot, and then their bones literally started rotting on the inside. Yeah, there's a femur there that, that was the victim of a gunshot wound, and just look how deformed and strange the bone became. Okay, so you've been, you've been, uh, you've been shot, you've uh, been through surgery, your bone got infected, you had to have your limb chopped off. What do you do now? Well, you just replace that limb here with one of these wonderful prosthetics. Here are some uh, Civil War era prosthetics. You can see the metal caging there on, uh, on that one. And then down here, we have a prosthetic arm. It says it had articulating fingers. So yeah, that was probably pretty advanced back in 1864 see kind of the evolution of the uh, artificial leg here this is an 1866 era leg this is from uh, 1945 and uh, you can see this one has the big strap that straps to your thigh and then this is a 1960s era tendon bearing prosthetic you can see these uh, these artificial arms here this one has like a whole pulley system to help work the hand. I guess you can open and close the hand by pulling on the other side. And then this prosthetic hand here almost has like spring-loaded fingers. Dialysis section here. You see those uh, diseased kidneys. And then here is an artificial kidney. It's, it's interesting, like this giant machine is nece necess necessary for replacing you know, a very small body part but uh, for humans to get it to work correctly it has to be this big giant machine all right into the brain section see this giant jar here containing a brain and spinal cord and there we have some brain models over here look at that big uh, look at that big brain down here we have a plastinated head meaning that's just a real slice of someone's head. They use chemicals to turn the tissue into plastic. It's kind of like the body works displays you'll see. And then uh, back here, this, is, this guy here is a map of the nervous system. Here we talk about traumatic brain injury. You can see uh, the football helmet. You know, there's been a lot of attention drawn to traumatic brain injury in the sport of football. You know, the helmet's supposed to protect people's uh, brains, but doesn't, you know, work as well as uh, we hoped once upon a time. 
And of course, you know, people in the military are always at the risk mm -hmm. of suffering uh, traumatic brain injuries. But, you know, these helmets designed to protect them to, uh, mm -hmm. to some degree. And this is a infra scanner. It says this is actually could be used in the field, on the battlefield or on the sports field to check for traumatic brain injury uh, right away. Yeah, these are all different injured brains here. These three have all taken uh, gunshot wounds. There's a brain with a cerebral hemorrhage. You can see that dark spot there. There's a brain that has suffered an ice pick, an ice pick wound. This one is a sharp force trauma. Wow. It's kind of scary you think about all the horrible things that can happen to your bones or your organs. Oh, this brain here, this brain here was stabbed with scissors. This is, these are some terrifying scenarios. Here is the Civil War era treatment for uh, traumatic brain injury where they'd actually chisel a hole in the skull to uh, relieve the pressure. And it says that this is actually one of the earliest known surgical techniques. These two skulls here are pre-Columbian skulls where they removed a piece of the skull to relieve swelling on the brain. That there, that's a big piece of skull that they, they took out of, uh, of this person here. Talks out about some of the rehabilitation uh, connected with traumatic brain injury. It says this Xbox was actually used by patients at the Walter Reed Medical Center to help like train their train their their minds after they'd uh, suffered uh, a brain injury by playing uh, playing different games. There's a talking tactile brain. It says touch the model to begin. So talking tactile brain. Touch the model now to begin, or don't touch it and wait for instructions. Frontal okay. lobe. Okay, that's the frontal located lobe. in the cerebral cortex at oh. the front of your brain. Oh, the okay. frontal lobe controls your consciousness judgment, emotional responses, and expressive language. How oh. you choose and associate words. Oh, okay. Let's touch, touch, touch this part. Cerebellum. Is the cerebellum right there? What's this? Basal ganglia, a cluster of structures basal ganglia. in the center of basal ganglia. Amygdala. Well, that's the amygdala right there. What if we touch this? Spinal cord. Oh, just the spinal cord. What's this? What's this little thing right here? Olfactory bulb. Oh, it's the olfactory bulb. And see these children's skeletons kind of show us the development of the skeleton. This is a fetal skeleton at uh, four months, so that's while well, it's still in the mother. Five months, seven months, eight months. So you just see how rapidly that grows from a tiny little four month skeleton to an eight month old skeleton, and then a month later, it's that big. So that is. That is five months of human growth. That is absolutely crazy when you look at how, uh, how much growth happens here. There's an infant skeleton at three months, 23 days, it's 11 months, 20 days. So it immediately, immediately slows down quite a bit once you leave uh, your mother's body. This is a three-year-old. These are both three-year-olds right here and a five-year-old. So yeah, it's kind of amazing. You think about it. This happens. This happens in nine months, or actually five, five months, because that's a four-month-old skeleton. So in five months, this massive amount of growth, and then you can see how how much it slows down. This is a five, five-year period. Now we've seen a lot of disease here. We've seen a lot of horrific injuries, but here is the healthy human body. So we get to look and see what a body looks like when it's not infected with disease, not blown apart by bullets and cannonballs. This here, this is what the healthy human body looks like. And somehow, it's even more horrifying. <laughs> oh my goodness. You can see the fingers there. You can see all the tendons and moving parts inside. Yeah, the hand is so complicated when you look at it like this. These are all the healthy, human body parts. In this case, that is a giant tongue. A model of the human tongue there. Here are some remnants of a field hospital in Iraq. This is the 
uh, Ballad Theater Hospital. I guess this was a wall in the hospital. I guess the hospital was demolished. They saved a wall here. The different soldiers signed the wall. See the emblem there. And then here's a chunk of the floor. They said that this was, I guess, when, when people were injured, they'd pull them into the hospital, lay them out on the floor, and this is where they would work on them. You can see all the scuffs there from, uh, from their work. And apparently they said so many lives were saved on this floor that when it was demolished, they took this chunk of floor to, uh, to commemorate all the lives that were saved in this very spot. So it says that uh, hundreds, hundreds of lives of American soldiers were saved in this spot right here. It's the evolution of the military helmet. So you can see from the holes, some of these were, I guess, not, uh, not as strong as they needed to be could be penetrated by bullets. Actually, as I'm looking at it, it looks like maybe the bullets did not go all the way through. So they, they definitely uh, definitely did their job. But uh, wow, that would, that'd be pretty close for comfort if that was if that was my head. There's a modern uh, modern military helmet. I guess that's a lot more stronger. It prevents uh, prevents bullets from entering it. There's some more prosthetics. These are some very advanced ones down here. See like that blade style foot. I know there was controversy about uh, about uh, runners using this, that it would actually somehow give them an advantage over a regular leg. And then look at that arm there, that's a, like a fully robotic arm, that's pretty amazing. See this mannequin here, on its chest it says Copper Man, it's almost a low budget version of Iron Man. It's, uh, instead of Iron Man, it's Copper Man. <laughs> but apparently this uh, Copper Man's purpose was he could, uh, because they, they could heat up the copper, they could test the uh, insulating properties of uh, military equipment without having to use a real human body. Here's the wall of facial reconstruction. You can see these models here document these injuries, these, uh, these injuries suffered in the military and uh, how they are repaired over time They're using skin grafts to cover this injury here to see how horrific some of these facial injuries are and uh, you can see the process they use to reshape the face and uh, cover up the injuries looks like they use like skin from elsewhere in the body to cover up the holes and kind of reshape the face see on this face here they use the the little pieces of metal there to, to brace the nose. Looks like there's been an injury to the face and nose that they've straightened out. And the helmet here, where it kind of helps reform the face. They've got like almost like braces in the mouth to, to fix the structure. It's a little piece of metal there on the nose as well. see that it is Traumatic Brain Injury Awareness Month. It's the different brain models here. And look at that. That is a, uh, a medical model of a cranial dissection. So this would have, this is not actually someone's head, this is a recreation, but this is where they actually uh, dissected someone's head to open it up so people could study uh, the brain and the inner workings of the head. So thank you for joining me here today at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. As you see, a amazing collection, an absolute amazing collection. I, I, I am blown away every time I come uh, to this museum. You got just the, all the different medical oddities. The, you, got, you got pieces, chunks of three different presidents on display in there. It is, uh, it is amazing. And you know, it, it does in a way, it shows kind of the horrors of, uh, of war and of what people do to each other. Just see all those just piles and piles of, of Civil War bones blown apart, bullets in them, shattered. It, it, it makes you think of just like the, the, the real like nuts and bolts brutality of, of war and human combat you know you you definitely hear about casualties and losses and it's all very very sad but there's something 
about going here and just seeing the, like, the nitty gritty of what the impact directly on a human body is. And it, it does, it does make you think and it does make you, you sad for the people that have had to endure uh, that level of violence. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it you know makes makes you think. I'm not saying that I, that I, I'm not making any statements here, other than it just it just uh, it just makes you think. But and by the way, this museum is uh, you know it's it's national, it's it's owned by the U.S. government, so it is free to go inside. It is uh, there's no admission, so that means there's no excuse to pass up this museum. I would definitely um, you know you have the the main strip of Smithsonian museums down at the National Mall. They're all wonderful, but don't forget, don't forget to come over here to Silver Springs, Maryland and check this out because this, this is truly a, uh, a special place, just a, an unbelievable collection. So thank you so much for, uh, for watching this. Thank you for coming along with me. Uh, if you like these videos, please subscribe. I travel around the country, I film roadside attractions, museums, haunted houses, amusement parks, other fun, random things. If you'd like to help support the channel, Consider donating to Patreon three dollars or more, which a postcard once a month from me to you. Also, selling enamel pins in the Etsy shop. Hopefully, get some new pins in there very soon. Also, doing cameos, uh, personalized messages. You can send them to your friends, family, to yourself. I've had a lot of fun doing them. So, if you if you'd like that sort of thing, consider checking that out. All the information is in the description, and all that it goes to help keep this train on the track, this hospital ship in the water and this dirigible in the air. Until next time, my friends, this one's in the bag.